All right, uh, let's uh, get started. So welcome to the uh, Center for Transportation Logistics uh, Research Webinar. Uh, today we have with us Professor Arnold uh, Hugsermeyer. Uh, he will talk about uh, putting supply chain resilience theory into practice. This is a fascinating topic, uh, which is quite important for practitioners and academic likewise. And especially we have seen that post COVID, uh, this topic has gained significant importance across all industries. Uh, let me, before giving the floor to Professor, let me talk about a bit about his background and his uh, pedigrees. He holds a PhD degree from the Wharton School and a dual MSc degree from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. He taught, among others, at Kobe Institute in Japan, the University of Chicago and the Wharton School, and at uh, VHU's, WHU's Otto Besom School of Management. Uh, he has published uh, widely in very top uh, management science journals, including management science, uh, MSOM, marketing science, OR, POM, along with practitioners' uh, magazines such as California Management Review and HBR. Uh, he's also co authored 10 management books and management quality for industrial excellence, uh, especially the variable tax principle, the supply chain finance, and the blockchain technology are some of his research interests. Uh, he has done a lot of work also on the interface of operations management and marketing, and particularly global suppliers management. Uh, presently, he acts as the DE for the management journal MBR, and also a senior editor for uh, two areas in the academic journal POM, which is also FD50 journal. Uh, his research has received several recognition awards, uh, including uh, one of the big awards we know is for sure Informs France Edelman Award, uh, the Euro Management Science Strategic Innovation Prize and the Marketing Science Practice Prize. Uh, for years, uh, he has been actively involved in academic initiatives by retail manufacturing associations at the national and the international level. I wanted to know his work in auto industries, very, very fascinating and quite influential work. And he also teaches primarily e-commerce operations as well as analytics courses to graduate and executive students. So without taking much time for Aunt, I would give the floor rather the Zoom to him. So our audience here, uh, please uh, have also your questions. Also, you can post them in the Q&A window. And I'll be moderating it as the session progresses. And we also hope towards the end, we'll have some time to also have conversations with Professor. So the floor is yours and welcome to the session. Right, Devjit, thank you so much. Uh, um... It's a great honor for me to, to be invited here to speak to you. And um, I'm uh, very curious to find out uh, what, what challenges you have um, uh, from, from the perspective of India. But I will also, uh, in this talk, uh, uh, bridge the gap. So I will talk about what we've learned from companies that we interviewed. And let me just say a little bit about those companies. Um, these were like very big companies, uh, well-known uh, companies in the automotive industry, for example, in Germany, leading firms, uh, but also in, in the US, uh, big electronics companies, uh, 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 computer uh, companies, and as well in, in Asia, we had access to a remarkable set of companies uh, where we asked them at the beginning of COVID, um, how did you respond to, to it? And then what we'll see is there is a clear uh, distinction between what consultants tell you what to do. Um, I will talk about the three main strategies consultants always advocate as a fourth one. And uh, I'll leave you to judge it, but in hindsight, um, you will see they're very capital intensive strategies and they're very risky strategies. And then when we look and, and uh, what I wanna show in the beginning in the first half of this presentation is what companies are actually doing. Uh, and they're not that naive in terms of what, what is recommended by, uh, uh, it's not that uh, the consultants are wrong, but they are really shortcuts. Um, example is hold inventories, right? It sounds so easy, but it's, it comes with some penalties and, and there are alternatives to it. And, and companies uh, have big alternatives. And what we critique uh, our colleagues from Stanford Wharton who are involved in this uh, research, we, we critique that uh, it seems to be one size fits all is the main message, but there is not one size fits all. And then so in the second talk, second half, uh, I will quickly tell you how you can position yourself in, in a two by two grid and say, well, my, my com company is more an arch type one or arch type two, and I should be doing something totally different than what these people do in the other part of, uh, of this quadrant. So, so the message learned, the message or, or the insights you can gain here is 
uh, learning from the top, top companies, what they have done, which is different from what everyone else is recommending, um, including the World Economic Forum. And then, um, so you, you judge yourself, see the insights, and then um, you, I'll give you a mechanism to, to find out the best tailored response for your company um, that you can immediately adopt if you wish uh, by tomorrow morning. Okay, so let's go start. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Um, okay, so I hope you can see it. Um, again, yes. this is uh, the group of people that um, has met for the last 10 years. We've done uh, research on global supply chains um, for a number of years um, and uh, have published quite a bit. Um, these are Morse Cohen from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Shiliang Chui, uh, is Georgetown University, like his colleague from Ricardo Ernst. Uh, Sebastian Deutsch is a doc was a doctor student with us. And then Panos Kovelis is from Washington University, Professor Auli, famous professor from Stanford. And Professor Hiro Matsu from Tokyo International University. And Andy Tse from Santa Clara. And we discuss actually after this presentation, we'll have a meeting with the, this group uh, to discuss um, changes in global trade flows where we have data and we see some pronounced changes uh, in that where India is one of the main beneficiaries in this. Okay, so let's go into uh, supply chain resilience. So let me define it and then uh, talk a little bit why we observe a big gap uh, because companies are not happy about the resilience and, um, and then see um, which strategy should you do. Um, and, and we introduce this notion of bespokeness how companies um, define what the right response is to resilience. And then uh, we can have a discussion afterwards. Does that sound good? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yep. All right. So, so it, it's on the minds of everyone. And um, we have just completing a, a report now on geopolitical uh, risk hedging. And there's both operational responses, financial responses, and organizational responses to geopolitical risk hedging. But so this uh, topic of resilience will not uh, um, disappear from the minds of executives, just the opposite. It will remain there and uh, it will remain there for some time if you look at global warming and some other risk types which are um, not going to be uh, disappearing soon. And so uh, if you look at uh, what we see is the literature is very broad, right? So some people say there should be preparedness, there should be a quick, swift response when it happens. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so on. And so there's a big, big uh, challenge, but literally there's no agreement and there's a lot of confusion between the terms agility and resilience. So people say we should be agile. Is that now resilience or not? And we make a clear distinction between the two. Um, so what is really common in, in any uh, in these crises? We have three phases. Um, there's something before a disruption happens. There's something during the disruption and post disruption. So everyone agrees on the three phases of, of um, so when you talk about resilience, we, we, it's linked to a disruption and there's three phases around the disruption, pre, in and post, right? And, um, and people then, uh, when they talk about definitions, they say, should one uh, be prepared? So like if you're the Red Cross, you pretty much prepare, anticipate that there's crisis coming and you are fully focusing on just preparedness. When it happens, then you execute and deploy. Or is it all about recovery, stabilization? You have plans ready in the you know, drawer and to say, when something happens, we have a plan to stabilize and return to growth relatively fast. Um, so people uh, uh, are either on either side of the, the, this uh, spectrum. Um, some people are on both sides and, and that makes it a bit hard to to see um, what, what should companies actually do, right? Because there are some costs involved. So agility for us is short-term, is to ability to respond rapidly and cost-effectively to short-term changes in demand or supply disruption. So this may be ordering immediately inventory and, 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 and secure some supplies, that may be agility, but the supply chain resilience to us means that you are able to structurally change the supply chain, the products and the technologies, right? To, to respond to this. Uh, to this crisis. Agility is a short-term response versus supply chain long-term response. And there are a multitude, and everyone study that you see talks about the multitude of, of disruptions happening. And, uh, um, and so the question is, is this now a source of competitive advantage 
or is it just a means of, for survival, supply chain resilience? And uh, if you look at the reports, and we, we, no offense to the consultants in the, in the, in the audience, and, and they, they've done a fantastic job to, to structure these uh, topics and, and, and give some guidance also on how to respond to it. And in the early days, and still most people see multi-sourcing, it's uh, certainly a strategy that is uh, very useful. Inventory, it uh, certainly works in the short term and in the beginning of any crisis. Regionalization, there is already people are split around that. And there's a fourth one, which is vertical integration. So that's a very costly strategy. So uh, these four strategies have been really, really advocated in the media uh, to do so. Um, and now the, the, what I want to share here, this is, you know, people can do this, um, but it's very costly. And there is uh, an alternative is, is digitization, right? So it's, it has to be linked with digitization. That's what most people do. Um, and that will we'll go into this. Now here, a quick sh a look at data. So you see from the economists, they look uh, on the right-hand side, you see the uh, orange one, five to seven. This is companies um, have now inventory up to six to 12 months. And then you see the bluish to the left is 11 to 14. So people hoarding now inventory three to six months. And I subscribe to automotive news. If you, I just looked at Monday on the latest data, there's still millions of cars canceled around the world because there's shortage of chips, right? So um, there is some in inventory imbalances. So if you have chip, chip shortage, but you're hoarding a lot of inventory, that causes a lot of problems for companies. So if one part is missing, uh, then inventory uh, um, may not be the right response to, to do, right? It's not that the consultants are wrong, but it's just in that situation, it was um, it, it doesn't work always, okay? So that's the problem we have here. It's the, a one size fits all approach. Um, you have to be very careful whether you deploy these uh, three recommended strategies. So uh, let me quickly show you what supply chain resilience is in the minds of the, you know, I'm not gonna name companies, but um, you can imagine the type of companies we would like to talk to is the BMWs, the Cisco's and the Lee and Fung's and others of this world and there are more. And, and this is what they tell us, right? So, um, so you have these uh, in A+. Uh, the first thing you would like to have is end-to-end -end visibility in the supply chain real data, you see the inventories, you see um, delays, um, and you have a value stream and you know that your costs, right? If at the disruption, you have to figure out what, what the costs are um, and, and you have no uh, cost uh, visibility, this is not uh, uh, helping you in, in, in crisis situations. So that's a given one. The second one is you have uh, really information sharing and the risk assessment and monitoring. Um, so companies um, actually look at the Financial Times daily to see what risk has popped up. And then they go through an exercise. So there might be some minor crisis, right? So something uh, you know, in the politics sphere is happening. And they go every day by looking at the Financial Times as, as just a, a, an instrument to, to check whether their uh, risk management is, is really in place, right? And you can do this easily yourself. And you can practice. Why is that? Because every day we're facing crisis, every day. And uh, companies like Cisco does this actually. So you have an integrated business planning, you have scenario and contingencies, you, you check them and see whether if that crisis would affect your operations in any way, could you respond to it? So that's a mind game, uh, an end-to-end -end control part. Of it. This one is a very important one. You have assurance you can always access your data even in a really severe crisis, 24 seven from any place in the world. And you have a digital twin and it's really scalable, right? So if something else comes online, you can immediately integrate this into your data lake. Uh, and you have AI not only on the supply, so it, outside in thinking, you see uh, changes in demand stream, but also in the supply stream. And by the way, I'm also working here with the SCORE people on the next generation of the next SCORE model, where this is gonna be the dominant part of the next SCORE model. So you have actually, uh, you're not looking just on the, on the demand uh, disruptions, but also on the supply disruptions. And then the final one, you have a readiness, you have a supply risk function, right? So we have repeated drills, as I said, the extreme cases, Cisco every day, they look at Financial Times and what's the journal see, what, what uh, disruptions are make it to the front page. Then they look at their risk uh, analysis team and then figure out if there was any unpreparedness in their organization. 
Um, so it has to be a real management focus. So people say, oops, or there were, we didn't think about the crisis. Supply chain was going well, um, and, and, and only in, uh, in case of a true disruption, people start thinking about risk. This is not going to help much, right? So stress tests are very common. So this is kind of the digital backbone, if you wish, right? So you have not only the data, you have uh, visibility, end-to-end -end visibility, you have awareness at the management level, you have doing repeated drills and, and you are, you know, no matter what crisis you are facing, you say it's just like the one yesterday, right? Maybe more severe, but we know how to, to execute and respond, okay? And then um, there's two, two, two kinds of things that you need to do. Of course, everyone talks about redundancies and yes, inventory does come into play. Um, you could also have backup suppliers, which probably is the most powerful way to, to maybe if you're local suppliers, that is always a very good one. Um, you can do postponement. So you have uh, products only in uh, multilingual packaging, for example, or you can have uh, you know, ship in postponement. Um, you can also move party operations, uh, relocate or near shore. Um, that's happening in electronics industry from Asia right now to Mexico. Even though there are no suppliers in Mexico, there's a, you know, a trend to, to, to um, grow the supply base. So um, supply options um, and, and developing these suppliers is uh, uh, building the redundancy. Right? And in some cases, you may uh, worry about supply chain financing um, that may be needed uh, just to secure um, the viability of the supply chain. So otherwise, nodes and links of your network will drop off. Okay. And then finally, you have flexibilities. Uh, so these come in the form of uh, distribution networks, which are more uh, robust. Mm, some companies shift everything to e-commerce. That's a powerful strategy uh, to shift uh, away from uh, uh, stores to e-commerce. Um, they also shift, this is very powerful, they also shift um, inventory in anticipation of uh, shutdowns by countries. So if China is... Uh, as the, uh, there's a danger of completely shutting down, then the warehouses will be filled up locally, right? So even though the factories cannot produce, um, the, the, the inventory is already migrating in before the shutdown into those regions. And of course, product standardization helps an awful lot. Um, you have variable bill of materials, people design basically themselves out of the, out of the uh, um, disruption. So if you have the ability to, um, one big way to avoid disruption is to design, change your bill of material, design yourself away from the disruption. And then, but the strongest one, and no, here the consultants are not responding that much here on this one, is to uh, share the burden with your suppliers, with your partners. So very strong partner networks where, where we see when you look back and see who had the best response to, to disruption, are the ones that have the best, the closest link with their partner network, right? So uh, strong relationships where you trust and fairness plays a role. So it's very hard to achieve if you're purely transactional and then uh, um, uh, confrontational relationship, it is very hard to, to um, soften the impact. So everyone understands that. So if we talk to C-level people you know, in automotive, in electronics, in fashion, in e-commerce, um, in computers, they all agree, this is the way to do it. And even, by the way, when we now have interviews on geopolitical risk, they say it's the same. You know, there's only, um, uh, we, we asked them, our executives, um, is there any other recommendation? It's geopolitical risk, you know, everyone talks about it. it. Would you come up with different hedging strategies? I said, no, in principle, it's the same. There's some slight modifications to it, but as I say, these are this. Now, this chart will be published in MBR. It's, um, we just submitted the final proof of it, um, so that's forthcoming. Any questions? So this is how you do achieve resilience. Yeah, no questions so far in the Q&A as such. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of the roadmap. Everyone agrees on. But the question is, and here comes the, the story is, when we ask a lot of executives, are you satisfied with your, so they all can say that this is how we totally agree. We sent this chart to, to executives say, wonderful, there's nothing to add from my side. It is really how this should be done. So independent of industry, industry, independent, whether these people come from the US, Europe or from Asia, they all agree, say, this is the roadmap, they all agree. 
And um, but if you ask uh, executives at the C level, are they satisfied with the degree of resilience in the organization? Turns out, no, they are not. Um, and it's actually a big fraction say no. And then, so if they all know, then we we ask the question, but why? If they all say same and say this is how one should do it, and they're not satisfied with it, I didn't implement most of the strategies. And then why not? So again, here's a, uh, we can share this later, but it's uh, you know from a wide range of uh, industries, um, and almost all of these have been nominated for the Gartner Power of the Profession Award. I'm also one of the judges of that award in the US. So um, excellence in supply chains. So those are the, mostly the companies that we talk. Um, and so the, there is this uh, um, answer by the executives. They say we put weights on what of that portfolio. We really need to say this is a high priority. Um, and so they weigh the values and the importance of the resilience strategies and then do part of it, right? And why? Because pretty much there is a lack of resources to do it all. And so there's, um, that's one of the secrets, first of all, but here comes the trick. So the companies who do it well, they know their uh, budget or the constraints, their resource constraints, and their boundary conditions. And, um, and we'll talk about these in a second. Um, and, and not go for the optimal solution, but also consider the second best. So rather than doing something that is uh, theoretically you know, the best for the company, they will say, we've given our boundary conditions, we, we choose the second best, not the, the best. And uh, above all, they start really collaborating with partners um, in, in the network. So to make it successful, so share the burden, use information as much as possible, um, prioritize, uh, not doing this uh, big um, blank sheet uh, that I showed you uh, all at once, mm, knowing your limitations. Now we have companies, and I didn't put it in because it gets reported, where uh, companies uh, have taken our framework and made it corporate strategy for you know, in the next two years. So there are cases, and um, I, I, um, maybe I can share this um, if it's anonymized. Um, so we have companies that use this entire you know, four enablers and the six um, uh, uh, flexibility options here and, and made it really corporate strategy to for their supply chain. Right, so that's but that's a very bold move to go on all fronts forward. Um, now, what are the limitations here? What makes it so hard uh, to do what what seems to be so obvious? And there's six factors. And when once you hear them, you say, "Well, obviously." Um, but let's 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 discuss them um, in the next few minutes, and 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 then you can reflect and whether it applies to you. Um, heterogeneity of supply chains. What do you mean by this? There are companies that say to us, we chase every market opportunity that exists. So that means typically they build a next parallel supply chain and have then a lot of supply chains to master, right? Um, Henkel, for example, here you may know Henkel. They have, for example, uh, a business that goes for retailing, um, washing detergents and, and, and cosmetics. And, and parallel, they also hairdressers, which goes custom uh, supply chains directly to uh, hairdressers. And then they have adhesives. So very different, totally different businesses. And, and, and then you have to, you cannot do a one size fits all approach. Inventory would not help in that business. So it's really dramatically different portfolio of, of, of supply chains. And that's that's one of the big challenges, right? Next challenge is um, the, uh, you only control part of your supply chain. Uh, most companies have outsourced uh, to suppliers a big fraction of the value add. Um, so decision making is distributed. So you 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 are sitting on on you know of course you're the buyer, but you have uh, sometimes very big supply networks, uh, multi-tiered. Uh, for ASML, for example, they have seven layers down the road, so to say, and that needs to be coordinated. So the decision making is is not. Um, easy in that context, and, and, and that's uh, a big, big problem. The other one, the over, uh, the objective is not clear. So companies emphasize efficiency, 
and are not willing to invest in resilience um, measures. So that's kind of the hottest debate. Um, uh, what's it worth and, and should we do it? And we'll come to it. And then there may be also uh, a lack of resources because companies are in the midst of doing some other things as well. And um, you may not have um, the technological base, for example, or the resources in regions where you're not like, to French shore or near shore or reshore. So that's kind of also a big limiter. And um, so, so you cannot just redeploy manufacturing if you don't have the technological base um, in that, uh, that region. And then above all supply chain financing, options may not be available in all the parts of the world where it's needed, right? From, from the OEM's perspective. Uh, so it may be difficult to, um, to, to uh, uh, support uh, and strengthen um, and have the right supply chain financing resources available. Um, so very, let's go quickly through these six factors here. We have the heterogeneity, of course, companies we just talked about, portfolios of supply chains, um, and, and a one-size-fits-all approach across business units may not work. Uh, so you have to, especially when they share common resources, okay? So there's interde interdependencies and interactions uh, that need to be carefully um, uh, considered. A scale may not also be a, a contributing factor that these are too small of, uh, of um, product lines. Um, and then, um, you know, maybe one, uh, for example, if you fill big bottles, it may uh, limit your, your ability to serve uh, small micro uh, retailers or, or, you know, in this case, hairdressers, when you start building uh, only, only converting your assembly lines to do one package size and it's the large packages because it's important to get uh, um, PPE equipment and other um, products out fast to the market. Okay, so the diversity, the variety of supply chains the company uh, runs uh, challenges um, the, the resilience approach. This, the, the outsourcing, of course, also is a big problem and a limited visibility into the supply chain. That's a really, really a, a big limiter, right? So um, there's interest, uh, conflicts of interest. So we saw this in our interviews where the OEMs would actively search for new sources of supply, but also ask the, the existing supplier to invest. So of course the existing supplier would say that's unfair and, and observe the, the opportunistic behavior by the OEM. And that would of course create conflict in, in the supply chain. And then also how you share the cost burden. So if suppliers start to invest and take over manufacturing tasks, then who's going to pay for this? So it's not a trivial uh, decision and uh, could result in conflict rather than in, into um, better coordination and collaboration. Um, the companies are not willing to sacrifice some efficiencies um, because they assume huge costs associated with investments into redundancies. Uh, that's true. And uh, but uh, uh, there's always a, a short-sighted view on the side of the management. And there was told to us, for example, by uh, companies like Cisco, when they suffered through the financial crisis, they said, "Well, we we learned our lesson uh, how impactful it can be of not being able to serve the market." So the the whole cost that really uh, accrues then during a disruption is not really visible to the managers. And so you just have to factor in what is it? Is it just what is it really truly really total ended cost, right? What's that cost to you? And across the product life cycle, uh, where you consider the acquisition ownership and post ownership support. Um, and companies, unfortunately, are quickly, uh, once the disruption is over, revert to this efficiency only uh, 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 view. Um, that is, is, is quite a challenge. And we say it's flawed the cost accounting in this case which makes it difficult for managers to justify investments in redundancy. And then, of course, um, obviously, there is the uh, lack of resources. Companies are involved in digitization projects on, or maybe in post-acquisition integration. So they need to maintain the transformation of the organization, the day-to-day -day business. And of course, forward-looking resiliency investments become then a challenge uh, because it requires upfront investments with long-term payoffs. There are studies which say a company that doesn't invest will face a 42% loss in EBIT every 10 years. So McKinsey has a couple of those uh, analysis. 
how important it is, uh, how much EBIT and what's the chance of it. And that likelihood is increasing. Um, it's now, um, they say every 10 years, 42% of your EBIT, but it's probably now, by now, even higher. And then factor market limitations. Um, there is no ideal supply chain. You cannot say we go to India, but then you need the supply base as well in India. So this takes time to build. Companies are now proactively doing this in, in regions of the world to really uh, groom the supply base, right? So that's, that's uh, actively done. Um, so you cannot just say, I wish I was there, but uh, you need to make sure that your supply chain is uh, fully functional and can be, uh, has the right you know, supply base in, in the country. And finally, um, supply chain financing may not exist in places where you operate. So uh, you need to have it most likely in China. We have our supply chain finance book is translated into Chinese, will be available this summer in China. It's one of the top 1000 books for the Chinese uh, industry. And uh, of course, um, if there are government restrictions of financing some part of the supply base, it creates risks and um, companies do you know, partially relocate. Uh, we see big outflows right now out of China, Japan, and Korea into ASEAN countries in India, for that matter. So you can partly change the design, the bill of material, but you can also change the, the, the footprint and that's both happening. Um, and about supply chain financing um, is, is an important part of, of uh, having a resilient network. Okay, so this is um, the, the limiter. So summarizing these, um, now we cross check this with other studies and in the Gartner study, the heterogeneity of supply chain, the, the complexity that companies have to master is comes up as the number one barrier. The uh, focus, narrow focus on efficiency because not knowing the total landed cost is uh, barrier number two. Uh, limited resources, uh, financial resources uh, in the organization is four. And if you look at factor market limitations, 41% say they don't have the uh, ideal conditions in, in the countries where they like to French or near shore. And then supplier financing affects still according to that survey, this is a Gartner survey with 1,343 respondents, mostly C-level people uh, across the world. 22% um, say they would have needed or would need uh, supply financing. Okay. So these uh, are- Would you be open to answer the question now? Yes, sure, sure, sure. Sure. There's uh, one question from Dubesh. Uh, he has been asking like, we have seen some components such as semiconductors, mm -hmm. which are quite common across several industries based on the requirement. Uh, but the acceptance of latest technology in the end product was quite, quite different. And the supply chain was quite complex since the priority changed because of different purchasing power of different industry. They had different kind of buying powers and uh, different penetration of the technology, the end product. In such a case, what should the strategy be for such uh, customers who have less disadvantage, less advantage over others uh, to ensure the disruptions or manage the disruptions rather? Thank you so much. That's exactly the next talk, the next part of this talk, um, because people say, aren't you you're showing again, one size fits all, right? So you have this one big, uh, uh, but what about semiconductors? What about automotive people? What about consumer goods? And I'll, this is exactly what drove this. So we, we have this paper forthcoming in MBR and we have a John paper, which is now the second part here. Um, so no, let me just quickly, we'll jump, uh, I have to give you four remedies very quickly, and then we'll, we'll say uh, what each of the, what, what the industry should be doing. So here, um, the, the, so we said here are the barriers. Um, and then quickly what, um, and we said the consultants would say inventory regionalization and multi-shoring. Is that the best way to do it? Uh, and leave the operations as is. The answer is no. Um, what the best are doing. This is the best of the best. Um, they won all the sustainability awards and supply chain awards. Here is what they do. They have a corporate level, a hierarchical structure. At the corporate level, it's the command of, I mean, basically a central uh, command of control, right? So a, a control point. And then the region BU level, so at the, at the, at the uh, corporate level, uh, all the information is available. They set the standards and, and, and coordinate but they leave it up to the BU level to come up with the optimal footprint. Um, and that's the hierarchical structure of resilience, right? We have seen this uh, company here, it's 20,000 uh, parts sourced from 1 million, for 1 million SKUs. 
And there is a first level here, they, they set the guidelines, right? So, and, and across all business units. Um, and then uh, second level, they ask the network to, you know, responsible people to optimize their supply chain. So there is a central coordination that must be immediately be set up and, and that, that is softening the impact. Um, the second one is um, set up a supply chain risk management function. Um, they oversee risk measurement. So they are in the background. They see the risks coming, so to say, and take action, right? Uh, they have the end-to-end -end visibility and control and manage the response to any disruption, coordinate long-term adjustments after the crisis has ended, right? So this is Cisco. Cisco really had uh, you know, a big impact on, on, um, in, in the financial crisis. They set up a supply chain risk management function since 2010. And the SCRM uh, supervises business continuity plans, initiate resilience measures, such as proactively de-risking identified geographies by qualifying suppliers in other parts of the world. So they oversee this, right? They already take uh, action long time before it happens. And as I say, they look at the Financial Times every day and see whether their network is robust, right? Uh, Cisco um, practices crisis response action plans and fine tunes their supply chain designs daily, right? So that can be done. And then um, you can invest in strong partnerships, right? So um, that is also very, very helpful, which you can do in advance is is to uh, make sure that you get the support and um, you know as a company that's completely outsourced uh, it's, it's the computerless company and then uh, it really ties to the contract manufacturers and is extremely has a joint design and manufacturing approach um, to really make sure that they get the products always when there's a crisis you can almost imagine which this company is so this is um, and finally um, above all when there's a crisis make dramatic changes. So all people said, if there's a crisis, for example, we didn't even ask marketing, we just changed the labels. We, we just changed the packaging sizes. We just uh, sent the product to our most important customer. So these things are really um, a catalyst for change. And uh, everyone we talked to said, okay, this was kind of cleaning up our processes and, and, and put them on a new level. And again, um, this is here an example, uh, which you can read up and we can share the, the article also where it's described is basically after um, this is a consumer goods company where they now have a 2025 strategy going forward um, where they changed dramatically the, the core processes. Yeah? So, so if you compare these four, four mechanisms, having central control, have a risk management function, um, you know, do disruption as a catalyst and partner with your people, it's different from inventory regionalization and, 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 and uh, multi-sourcing, right? So it is really something you could do internally to be better prepared and, and, and act uh, faster. And it has less of a, of a limiting effect on, on being able to maintain revenue and show, um, uh, not have suffer from too much uh, drop in, in sales. But here was the question that was raised, right? So, um, but again, um, Four remedies that we say the best of the best do. Um, again, not necessarily regionalization is barely done. Uh, inventory, yes, people do, but they regret it and you see it in the news. And then finally, multi-sourcing. Again, if you have strong partners, it is at odds with strong partners. So what the consultants say, multi-sourcing seems to be very transactional, but in crisis, in the multitude of crisis, all over the world and may not help you in the long term. So partnering is the what companies do that um, show also a good track record. Okay, so so now it, but it depends. So we we in our second uh, paper we basically said well it depends a little bit on 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 the environment and um, again we did surveys here with um, companies and again we can share this later but be assured these are really really. Uh, important companies and and uh, our group of, of scholars was able to talk to the right people in supply chain, chief supply chain officers or CEOs of, of those companies. All right, so how to think about your own companies, think semiconductor. Um, you can say, is this, uh, my business has multiple independent supply chains. So the first dimension we look at is how many, uh, how, how you, what's the complexity? How, you, how do you run your supply chains? You can run with ease multiple supply chains. 
Very few companies do it. There are some companies that do it, but then the next level would be that you have at least one shared service, right? So, um, and, and a chief uh, central supply chain office, um, or you have central guidance, right? Um, and then finally, you have a one size fits all. So semiconductor are more one size fits all companies. That's one dimension. So, how many supply chains can you afford? And that's how really industry lines up um, on, on that dimension. And then the second one is um, your, your interaction with your partners. And so the, the lowest interaction is uh, less dependence engagement. You, you transact, you, you can procure globally commodities, uh, or you coordinate with tier one suppliers, or you have joint business planning with uh, really very few or one suppliers. You strongly collaborate on design, think of semiconductor. Again, they really collaborate with partners and then you have vertical integration. Um, so this is kind of what we see when we look at the companies that we talk to, the 20 companies and the business units that they represent, we plotted them. So you see um, on the right-hand side, Semiconductor would be a one, sing one product company uh, that is highly vertically integrated. And there's also the SMLs of this world, which are also in our sample. And um, they uh, are really one product. They see themselves also as one product companies. And you cannot have such big capital investments for multiple, many, many supply chains in parallel. And as you go down on this diagonal, uh, of course, at the low end, you see the retailers, right? So chasing every opportunity with another supply chain. It's easy for them to set up. In the middle, you have the automotive people that have strong tier one suppliers. So they have then, so that's kind of how people, companies line up. On the bottom dimension is how, how strong you need to collaborate. So if you have a single product uh, company, you need to almost partner with one company. Uh, you know, for example, Yen Optic or whatever, you know, the, the very strong uh, lens manufacturers are totally collaborating with the, the semiconductor manufacturers. Um, and on the bottom, you have transactional uh, and, and the retailers will, or the, the, the FMCG, not retailers, the FMCG, fast moving consumer goods companies uh, serving retailers, they will chase every market opportunity. Uh, outside that uh, 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 diagonal, you would hardly find companies um, uh, because it would be either too costly or would not make sense to just have few supply chains when you can chase market opportunities. So it doesn't make any sense to have only one supply chain when you can chase easily market opportunities and an ASML or a semiconductor firm is hardly able to finance multiple supply chains. And uh, so we, we said, okay, how can companies then decide where, where are they, right? So uh, you have to ask yourself eight questions, basically very simple product complexity, high-low, uh, homogeneity of your product portfolio, high-low, degree of product modularity, level of customization. And that time defines already the complexity that puts you more towards a single or multi supply chain. And then availability of suppliers, uh, level of push-pull, lead time, degree of outsourcing is on the process side. And, and we've done this and clustered these companies. And it turns out to have these three clusters. So our approach is quite, quite, uh, quite novel. And then uh, let me jump to it. So as a company, you have facing three types of complexities. The semiconductor people to the top right um, have a product complexity issue. They cannot design themselves out of their, their product. They have barely any other suppliers to go to. So they will have to be very smart in setting up a resilient supply chain. We'll tell you exactly what they do. So if you are in that business, super, super complex products, and you cannot design yourself out of it, and, and, and there are very few suppliers in the world, you, you face product complexity. The second level down, think automotive, you are relying on tier one suppliers. Then you have facing partner uh, complexity and, and what's, what's what resilience is partnering more. And then the process complexity, if you have a multitude of uh, processes, then uh, you have internal complexities. So uh, these are the complexities that arise in these three. So if you are more in a commodity business, transactional, you have then standardization issues. So this is exactly the approach. It's not inventory multi-sourcing or regionalization, it's something else. So let's go to, from top right, the semiconductor people. They set up the footprint very, very carefully um, and say, okay, there is risks. We cannot design ourselves out of this. 
Uh, so we're setting up carefully. And India may play a role here, right? So India uh, may be well suited for attracting those businesses um, to, to and, and companies are doing this already. Think of Apple going into uh, India and, and, and some other manufacturers. Uh, they've chosen India for maybe a, a more resilient footprint reason. And then these are long-term investments 30 years out. The second one is the, the, the relying on tier one suppliers. Um, there it's about increasing the visibility um, and, and the understanding for the other uh, partner in that business. And so companies investing heavily in partnership, um, visib in visibility enhancing um, strategies. And finally, if you have the chase every opportunity, there is a lot of product standardization and changes in the bill of materials. So you are able to produce uh, you know, from any location in the world or other locations. So, so as I said before, demand gets shifted. Uh, we've seen this uh, when there's a uh, uh, typhoon or going in or, or a hurricane or whatever happens, then immediately there shifts from the US uh, to Europe and, and conversely um, to, to supply it markets in other regions, okay? So again, product complexity, I think makes sense um, for the semiconductor, partner complexity, process complexity. So there is, a, there is a question here, follow up. Uh, do the shipping and the airlines would fall under which uh, quadrant? Would it be more like a process or partnership or mix? Uh, the airlines. Um, yeah, airlines, yeah. Yeah, well, there's, airlines would be manufacturer, right? So if you take the Airbus, they would be much more like a semiconductor, right? Carefully planning your footprint. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to relocate uh, Airbus facilities and, and uh, Boeing, I mean, hardly can imagine that these facilities get moved and there were some uh, additional hubs in, in um, uh, uh, Middle East uh, that were, have been set up, but uh, not too many. So they have a long, sense. long term perspective. Now, airlines as such, uh, they're quite flexible, right? So, I mean, they can relocate. So I would put them on the lower quadrant, right? So have the standardizing the, the approach and then, you know, being super flexible, how they can reallocate uh, shipping. Sure. So I think the shipping industry is more like the low quadrant and that's important, right? So um, here's the big message. Uh, that's exactly a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Figure out which quadrant you're in because the response differs. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and what you saw here uh, in, in uh, let me just go quickly, uh, the people advocated do vertical integration, buy up all your suppliers and move to the far right. Now, maybe that's a good strategy. I, we, we have never seen companies doing it. But then if you vertically integrate it, then you really, really have them cost is very costly. And think about the uh, de-risking your supply chain. Um, and um, so this is a starting point. This is exactly the right idea question that came up is to figure out, um, do I need to tailor this even more? We said in our paper, there's these three archetypes, how you can think of uh, you know, in, the, in a big way, but maybe they're in between shades of gray um, um, that needs to be more bespoke, right? And then of course you can use, uh, we all know re, uh, scenario planning and real options analysis, Monte Carlo simulations to tease out what happens if the future changes, um, but we don't have time here. So let me wrap up and, and uh, you know, almost over here in time, but uh, five insights that I wanna share here with you. Um, Knowing what strategies to emphasize can help with resource investments in light of budgetary or other resource constraints. Okay, so thinking about am I arch type one, the semiconductor people, am I like automotive uh, tier one suppliers, or am I a very you know agile? Um, I can set up shop everywhere and and and, and supply markets. Once you know that uh, who you are, uh, then you can tailor your response. Right? So that's that's. Um, and in given tight budgets, companies need to know what's the right investment partner relationships, or is it in de-risking the supply chains? And also is it in standardization? And, and um, be careful when you switch arch types. Um, as again, there was a lot of recommendation to vertical integration, reshoring, do it all by yourself. Um, so this is very popular these days, uh, but that changes also your, your, your perspective on, on what is the optimal strategy to do. And in general, awareness of different barriers help companies to realize if you know these six barriers, you can do a self-check of your organization, say which one applies to us, right? And knowing this, you we will uh, you can set expectations in in among your leadership team, 
and then know exactly how you communicate this in your organization. So it's very helpful to look at the six barriers before you, you invest, because finding it out later is, is, is a very costly learning in the organization. And then partner, right? uh, share the burden and uh, partners has come up uh, always, has not been discussed in any of the reports, but we feel that um, from the responses we get from, from, from top, uh, our, our interview partners, that is uh, very important. And then lastly, uh, set the right KPIs for the right strategy. So, um, um, so understanding your limitations, um, you may then set the appropriate uh, KPI to, to push the organization in either digitization or partnering or, or any other, maybe also maybe less inventory. All right, this is all I want to share today. Uh, I hope it's uh, what, what you expected me to do. And no, I think uh, I, I was just following your whole thought process and I was uh, really impressed with the mapping that you've done with the resiliency and the kind of industry structure. I think that one slide itself would have given a lot of thought to the companies. Uh, I think that, that was very exciting, especially the complexity of product, the process and how do you map to the resiliency framework. Uh, that that reminds me of uh, also some of the work during COVID times uh, that uh, you know Professor David Shimti Levy also worked uh, some part on the firm level resiliency. However, what you are talking is more about connecting different firms that across the whole supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. So, do you see any kind of linkages with this uh, earlier works of uh, on the where he developed the metric, the TTR, and other metrics? Uh, uh, yeah, with the whole supply chain. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, and you need a good uh, 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 time to operate, right? And uh, time to recovery. These are very key metrics to to put in place. Especially, um, these are absolutely important metrics. Uh, and uh, companies uh, uh, that are forward looking use those metrics uh, to justify investments upfront, right? So. Uh, there are many companies that are caught short and because they're so efficiency focused have a significant drop in uh, uh, shortfall in revenue. And, and, and but um, we also looked at this and, and um, there's also the role of corporate boards that are here important. So yes, you could have these metrics, but the boards have to uh, approve your investments because you can limit the uh, time to operate is extended or the time to recovery is shortened. These are very important metrics that boards need to understand and, and basically give uh, the leadership team a goal to invest in, uh, to, to, to support those objectives. Yeah. Very, That's important. very important, yeah. And just a follow-up question with that, uh, does your metrics that you have developed uh, also kind of change with the uh, length of the uh, disruption? For example, it could be, I know earlier we had the swine flu, which was short. Mm -hmm. However, this pandemic was quite long. We had sometimes volcanoes, which are shorter, but sometimes uh, also natural disasters could be sometimes longer. So is there a length of the disruption also matters when you think about, uh, because I will say you in India, for example, certain regions like uh, say Kerala, South of India, uh, they are quite, they like, see on recurrent basis, uh, like floods, floods were very common. Uh, on the other hand, some are completely non unpredictable. So do you have any kind of, um, you know, with the length of the disruption and the uncertainty of disruption also a kind of factor in, in this uh, kind of a theory? Yeah, no, no, I mean, we were observing strategies, but I, I, I know where you're going. I mean, we're also looking at modeling approaches, right? How mm -hmm. people have done this in the past and, and you know, we, look, we see real options literature. So people have looked at that uh, where they monitor underlying factors that change like stock prices or here uh, uh, co2 emissions uh, how they unfold in the future and then as a response you would say what should i be investing in to avoid any negative uh, impacts um and there are, you, you we need to be becoming better in in tracking these long-term evolutions right uh, there may be short uh, events that happen right and there are lots of them that will be happening um and and but i think it's the the ability to invest it's you, you should see this that there will be more coming right we also know there were more pandemics likely because as we have higher temperatures there's a higher chance if you read nature higher chance of having more pandemics so um i think it's not a matter of yeah well there's this one pandemic which was short and the other ones are longer 
you have to prepare for the future and the future doesn't look that good uh, at the moment. So we are yes. we'll almost anticipate that we will facing longer events, um, more horrible ones, I hope not, but uh, the predictions are there. All right, so there's a question, Akash, do you want to unmute and speak your question? Or? Okay, he has this type tips question as well. Um, he says that, Prof, I agree with your most of your thesis on automotive sector. What metrics or tools would you recommend to increase the visibility in this auto sector where there are so many new mega trends and policies are playing out along with geopolitics from mining to semiconductors to innovative uh, mobile as a service or whatever. Yeah, all the innovation disruptions. Yeah, yeah disruption. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of movement right now in the automotive sector, right? So uh, from moving away, for example, from assembly lines, if you look at Tesla and some Toyota, which is completely doing this now, uh, adopting totally different approaches, which are in the regard less uh, time consuming, less resource consuming, and thinking dramatically about changing the footprint. So if you can stamp the front and the back and assemble it uh, independently, so you have a more density of workers, I mean, it's a metric that says you want to be sustainable and you want to be more resilient and more cost efficient. So there are approaches, in, especially in automotive these days, which can achieve all three, right? So um, I think um, there's, um, and also social, right? So immediately if, uh, if you do it locally, then uh, all, all ESG will all be positively affected. Uh, so I think the, the industry, uh, especially automotive is, is very good in, in uh, moving forward to radically new approaches, which are more eco-efficient, uh, both economically and, and, and environmentally. Um, and we have another paper, which is published on SSRN, we've surveyed the industry on those metrics, the um, uh, environmental and the performance metrics, and which one they use in combination. Let me say this, the, the outcome here is that they're all short-term focused. Uh, none of the companies that we serve at Austin Automotive have a long-term KPI, right? So it's all short-term KPIs. And, and one of the uh, recommendations we do is to think of long-term KPIs. So uh, reducing short-term um, uh, shortfall in revenue would be a long-term KPI. Uh, having a CO2 impact of certain magnitude would be a long-term uh, KPI. But the existing KPIs, which we report in that report on SSRN, Social Science Research Network, uh, is they're all short-term, short-term and ignore the long-term effects and the resilience effects. So you can look that up and see. Sure, sure, sure. And also, uh, you also mentioned about the MBR uh, article. So when you when they get featured, please let us know. We'd be happy to send it to all of our yes, uh, participants. Should. Final yes. proof now today, and then uh, they were fast in submitting, and then we'll, we'll forward to you when you can. Yeah, it. send it to all the participants out there. Yeah, beautiful. We have just one more minute. If anybody has a question, please, uh, you can either unmute and speak, or you can write on the uh, Q&A. So if anybody has some final, final questions for on. <laughs> All right, looks like uh, it was very clear. I think and you did an amazing job. I think uh, people, uh, I'm sure where all the participants benefited from the ideas that you presented here. Uh, I, can, I can imagine that is a huge uh, heterogeneity in our audience coming from several from startups, from large industries. I'm sure all of your thoughts resonated well with them at different capacities. So thank you again so much for presenting this uh, and our flagship. Uh, CTL seminars, and I'm sure you will, uh, if you're in India sometime, we'd love to host you in person, Thank you uh, so but much. I'm sure also virtually uh, in the future we'll be connected with you. Right, we have okay. our, our partner university, so thank you so much for hosting me, and if anyone has questions, please send me uh, an email, I'm happy to answer, or hook up via LinkedIn, um, we can discuss further. Thank you so much, Arn, and thank you all the participants for joining, uh, have a lovely evening uh, out here, wherever you're from, so thank you so much. Thank you.